century of when the uh, hymn was first written. Do you know what language it was first written in? Russian. Yeah, I always assumed that was an English hymn because it fits, works so well, doesn't it? Yeah? Okay, but it was actually written 75 years ago in Russian um, by some Russian believers who were uh, working amongst Ukrainians who were fleeing from Ukraine into mainland Russia. And they wanted to minister and help and encourage them. And they wrote, how great thou art. So now you know the real story behind the, that amazing hymn. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Let me just pray. Gracious Father, thank you again. We can just come conscious that you have brought us here this morning to worship you and to meet with you, to hear your voice and to fellowship together. And so in these moments, Lord, we pray that our spiritual ears may be open and that your voice may be clear to us, we pray, for your glory's sake. Amen. Amen. So just a quick recap uh, from a couple of weeks ago, and Joachim was here last week, but um, week before that, I began to speak around uh, the nature of our relationship with God. And uh, we saw three great truths, three things which are, if we have committed our life to the Lord Jesus, these things are true. Firstly, that God is our Father. God is our Father. That is how he wants us to address him. That's how he, you know, his word invites us to speak to him because that best defines the relationship we have with him. Secondly, the implication of that is then, of course, as children of God, okay, uh, I am your brother, and you are my brothers and sisters. That is just simply true, okay? It's not a fact that we can alter, it is truth. And we also looked at that extraordinary statement that Jesus made, that he is our brother too. That the Lord Jesus is our brother. And we saw how that's reflected in the fact that one day we will be, well we are, co-heirs with him of all, the, all God's glory. And we with him will inherit God's glory. So you know, tremendous truths, things which are, are true. I think it was pretty well later that day, or maybe the next day, I came across uh, a photo, uh, a, a saying, a photo, which is going to crop up on the screen, which I thought, it just, uh, yeah, I thought that's good, I like that. I've decided to give up on adulting. I am a child of God, not an adult of God, please. So it's making the point, isn't it, that we are, you know, I've been a Christian over 50 years, but I'm still a child. I'm a child of God, okay? I, you know, I haven't cracked it, okay? I'm still learning. That's the nature of my relationship, and our relationships always with God is that we are his children. Okay, so we move on this morning, and we're going to begin our thoughts, just thinking around, one of the great things about Jesus was that people loved asking him questions. And there was one particular day where people came and asked him a whole series of questions. They asked him about paying taxes and who they should pay taxes to. to. They asked him about uh, trying to catch him out very much uh, with certainly this, the second one uh, was, are we gonna, who are we going to be married to in heaven? You know, someone's had five wives, which one are they going to be married to in heaven? They thought that was a clever question, and, and Jesus gave a, a superb answer. And then he got asked a third question. And the third question we're going to just look at this morning. So we're in Mark uh, chapter 12. And verse 28. Not that we hardly need to turn to it because it's a very famous verse because it says, one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. So this was the previous two questions. 
Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Wow. We don't know what the, I mean, the tone of the ask is that it's a genuine ask, unlike uh, at least one of the other asks, which was about trying to trick him. This seems to be genuine. And of course, Jesus had an enormous array of potential answers that he could choose from. There were, of course, those things which at this point in time seemed to be the top commandment to the Pharisees, and they were things like keep the Sabbath day, pay your tithes, uh, make sure you clean the, uh, appropriately in your house, and things like this. They were terribly, terribly important at the time of Jesus. And of course, then he also had opened to him, well, all the commandments, including all the way back to the Ten Commandments. And even the, the first of those Ten Commandments, that would seem logical, wouldn't it, as being the greatest commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. Surely that would resonate. Maybe that is what this man was expecting, that Jesus would say. But of course, we know his reply. Verse 29, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So, what does Jesus do? Jesus says that out of all those things that we, in a, well, God tells us to do, the very, the most important one, he begins in verse 29, and he ends in verse 31 by saying the greatest There's no ambiguity about this. The greatest one of all is about loving God and loving your neighbor. And love, of course, is about our relationship with God, isn't it? And our relationship with our neighbor. So the most important thing Jesus says we can do in our lives is love. The most important aspect of living is our relationships with God and with other people. That is to be priority number one. That is the most, that is to be the greatest. That is to have the highest priority in our lives. Living is about making choices, living is about how we use our time how we use our effort. Living is about how we think, what we do with our money and our talents. And Jesus says in every aspect of our life, the greatest thing of all that we must focus on, that must drive us, that must, must, must affect our behavior, that must determine the kind of choices that we make as we live our lives, our relationships. And at the heart of that relation, those relationships, is that we are loving God and that we are loving others. Now, I think as Christians, it's pretty comfortable and easy to sort of say, yeah, 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 I got that, I got it. You know, that's what I'm doing. But hey, let's be honest with God this morning. Let's check out with God this morning. And hear what he's got to say about what is the greatest priority in our lives. Is it the greatest priority that God, that Jesus gives us in these verses? Jesus in his earthly life saw that there were particularly two other priorities that people got distracted by and turned their attention to. Things which in themselves are not wrong, but people made more important and gave a higher priority to than their relationship with God and with others. And I just want to pick up on those. And the first one we see in in Matthew 6, 
And so let me read a few verses from Matthew 6. Verse 24. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will love the one, uh, hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, that you will, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body? More important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown on the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Yeah. Jesus puts three points across to underlie the, import, uh, uh, the danger of money and things. You know, by money it's meaning things as well, isn't it? As the rest of these verses really go on to say. And show. So the first thing we see is that the, the words he uses there in verse uh, 29, uh, 25, sorry, 4, you cannot serve both God and money. It doesn't say you should not. It doesn't say you ought not. It says you cannot. It is not possible to be serving both God and money and possessions. There are those of us, myself included, who love to multitask. We love to do two things at once or three things at once. And whilst it is possible to multitask, you cannot multi-prioritize. You have to have a priority of one thing that is greater than the other. It is not possible to two, pursue two equal priorities. And Jesus is emphasizing that here, isn't he? And saying you cannot... When we're talking about God and our relationship with him, we cannot have God and other things equal with him. One thing will be greater than the other. It is not possible for us to, to pursue possessions and things and money and make that of equal, that will be of a greater status to us than God himself because we cannot serve both of them. And then he goes on to say, uh, the end of verse uh, 25, he says, is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? You know, is the purpose of life to eat? Is the purpose of life to make ourselves look good? Of course not. It sounds ridiculous when we put it like that. And yet, of course, that's what the world says to us, really, doesn't it? The most important things are how we look and in many ways, what we eat. But life is more important than those things, Jesus says. More important, far more important than those things. And therefore, it's crazy for us to make our number one priority pursuing things rather than God himself. And then Jesus gives a third reason why we shouldn't have this focus, this, that focus is the wrong way around. In verse 30, he says, oh, oh, you of little faith, oh, you of little faith, if God had closed the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, will he not much more close you of little faith? You see, if we, make, if we pursue and have a higher priority of things and possessions than of God, what we're showing is a lack of faith. Because God says, look, I've looked after the trees, I look after the birds, I look after the flowers, I'll look after you. I'll provide for you. And then we say, no, we don't accept that. We've got to do it ourselves. We've got to make it our own focus and we've got to pursue it in a greater way than pursuing you, God. No, Jesus says. We must not allow the pursuit of things to be of greater significance to us than the pursuit of God because that shows a lack of faith on our part. 
So Jesus warns about the priority, the priority of things, possessions, money over God himself. And the second thing Jesus demonstrates positively that we is not to be our priority. And we see that in, as an example in Matthew 9 and verse 18. Jesus just is our, is our perfect example. While he was saying that's Jesus, that's Jesus, while Jesus was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus got up and went with him. And so did all his disciples. And just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if I if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. And Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, my daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. We break in here seeing Jesus as a really busy guy, wasn't he? He was constantly in demand. People wanted him to go here, there, and do all sorts of things. And he's going off with this ruler to... Uh, heal his daughter and there's this woman who just comes along and who has her own desperate need and touches Jesus and Jesus could have just kept going he could have just said I, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm with the ruler at the moment I'm going off that way but he didn't did he he stopped he made time for the woman he spoke to the woman he encouraged the woman. And she was healed. In all his busyness of doing this, that, and going here, there, and everywhere, he was always willing, he was always willing to be interrupted by a person and to minister to that person. The same kind of thing is behind uh, the little story, again, that we know in Matthew 19 and verse 13. We read, then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and to pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought him, who brought them. And Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such of these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. You know, those around him did not have the priority for the children. But Jesus made the children the priority. Jesus wanted them to be the focus. Jesus wanted them to appreciate how special they were. And so whatever else others thought was going to be happening, he focused on the children. And it was only after he had blessed them and placed his hands on them that he then went on from there. The danger of fixing our mind and sort of saying we've got to do this, that, and the other, and yet not recognizing the needs that people have and the importance of focusing on relationships. You know, if you're like me, we love to get things done. And I, I like at the end of the day to think about the things that I've done. And God's been teaching me it's not really about the things you do. It's about the relationships that you have. It's about the people that you speak with. It's about how you strengthen your relationships with people, how you show that you're living the reality of that greatest commandment, to love God and to love other people. So let's go back into Mark 12 and verse 30. This greatest commandment, and, one, and the word that screams out as the most frequent word, I think, in the verse is, of course, the word all. Because we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. A reflection, of course, because it's that greatest commandment. In the Old Testament, people were described as being, they, they were just put into one or two groups, essentially, uh, many biblical characters in the Old Testament, they were either wholehearted 
or they were less than wholehearted, and some are called half-hearted. And just going to look at a couple of examples of that. Numbers, chapter 32, Moses is at the end of his life, and he's reviewing back the history of what's happened as they've come out of uh, Egypt and so on. And in Matthew 32, verse 9, he speaks and he says this. He says, after they, he's referring to the spies, as you'll realize from the story, after they went up to the valley of Eschor and viewed the land, they discouraged the Israelites from entering the land the Lord had given them. The Lord's anger was aroused that day, and he swore this oath, because they have not followed me wholeheartedly. Not one of the men, 20 years or old or more, who came up out of Egypt will see the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not one except Caleb and Joshua, for they followed the Lord wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly. Ten were not wholehearted. Two were wholehearted. And then David, when he comes at the end of his life and he's uh, reviewing things and looking forward, in uh, 1 Chronicles 29, he gives us this reflection and look forward. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 6. Uh, that's 2 Chronicles 29. Then the leaders of families, the officers of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, and the officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly... They're assembling things for the temple. Oh, yeah, they gave towards the work on the temple of God 5,000 talents, 10,000 darics of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 talents of iron. Any who had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the temple of the Lord in the custody of Jehu the Jershonite. And the people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. And then David prays a prayer about Solomon. And in verse 19, he's, in his prayer, he says, and give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, requirements, and degrees, and to do everything to build the structure which I have provided. In David was a wholehearted man, wasn't he? That didn't mean he didn't make mistakes, he did. But he knew God's grace and mercy towards him. But, when, but David lived his life in a way that was about being wholehearted. It was about pursuing God and making God the priority in his life. And the reality, of course, in the rest of the Old Testament is the characters there, the kings there, are basically... If you go into the text, they're divided into two kinds. There are those who are described as wholehearted, like Asa, Jehoshaphat, and Hezekiah, and there are those who are described as not wholehearted, like Amaziah, Uzziah, and Zedekiah. Wholehearted and not wholehearted. Which list are we on this morning? Are we a wholehearted person in our love for God and for others? Or are we a less than wholehearted person? Jesus said, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that seek first isn't in the sense of you seek it, you found it, and then you go and do something else. It's in the sense of seek first, first, first priority. Keep seeking. Live a life that's focused on the first priority. The thing that matters most, seeking God. David, one of David's cries in one of the Psalms says this, O oh Lord, give me an undivided heart. An undivided heart. That should be the cry of our hearts too. That we're wholehearted, we're undivided, we're complete in our absolute pursuit of loving God and loving others. So back to Mark 12 and the commandment. The commandment refers to our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our strength. And these aren't, we shouldn't treat these, uh, um, these as meaning sort of separate pieces of a jigsaw. 
that you sort of fit together and that equals us. It's not really like that. They're descriptions of aspects of who we are, which overlap, but they're used by God to, to describe the image in which he has made us, his image. But what does it mean to love God in this way? Our hearts, love him with our hearts. Go into the shops at the moment and their racks are full of cards with hearts on them. For Valentine's Day is coming up. And the heart is taken to represent love, isn't it? It's taken to represent love. And in that way is about expressing actually uh, the, the, the centre of our, our, our feelings and our emotions, the centre of our passion, things which drive us. On the, uh, after the resurrection of Jesus, later that same day, two men, you remember, were walking on a road to Emmaus, and the stranger came along and had the conversation with them. The stranger turned out to be Jesus, and when after Jesus revealed himself and disappeared, the two guys said to each other, sorry, maybe one of them may be a woman, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road? When Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached the sermon, the sermon finished and the people said to each other, well, sorry, the, te the text says to us, they were cut to the heart and they said, what must we do to be saved? And then Paul declares in Romans, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. Our hearts, very much the, sort of the driver, the centre of who we are, from where our actions flow, from where our passion comes, where our drive comes in life, where our emotions come, our feelings come. So this morning, are we loving God with our hearts? You know, when we come in here, I trust we don't leave our heart behind. We don't leave our passions at the door. We bring our passions with us. We bring our drive and our desires with us that we might worship God from our hearts and with our hearts. With all your heart, Jesus said. With all your soul. With all your soul. It's the same word which sometimes is translated spirit. And it's, it's, it's the word which reflects that uniqueness about us having God's character beyond all other aspects of creation. It's the eternal me. Jesus himself said, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Because it's me that will go on forever. So often the psalmists, psalmists began their psalms, didn't they? Um, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. When we, when we uh, are in a relationship with God, when we are loving God, there's something, well, that, that image of God which is within us, that he that the soul is connecting with its eternal source, God himself. As the deer pants for streams of water, the psalmist says, so my soul pants for you, O God. This morning, I hope we've worshipped God, we've praised God with our soul. We've sensed the, the, the relationship we have with him connection we have with him his spirit within us our eternal soul we love him with our soul we love him with our mind the place of our thinking the place of our, our reasoning and working out the place of our weighing up the place where we try and make sense our mind do we love him with our mind do we make the choices in our mind the right choices, choices to think and fill our mind with God himself. That's why we need to read this book, isn't it, and meditate on it, because we're filling our mind in the first instance. And we need to, through our mind, we can, of course, fill our hearts and our souls, but we need to take his word into our minds. We need his mind, don't we, the mind of Christ. Our mind is to be transformed. 
Romans 12 says to us. Our lives, sorry, are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Our mind, our thinking, our way of reasoning, our way of doing things. Love God with your mind. Does he occupy your mind? Is God, is God priority and important in our thinking? Love him with all your mind. And lastly, love him with all your strength. With all your strength. And we're probably thinking, ah, I haven't got as much of that as I used to have. But it's your strength. It's not someone else's strength. I shouldn't compare myself with any of you and you shouldn't compare yourself with anyone else. We're just to love God with the strength that we have. In any way, because strength isn't meaning physical strength, is it? It's meaning determination, really. It's, it's, it, it, indeed, it isn't the word for power. It isn't about sort of force and might. It's about resolution and determination. And we are to love God with all our resolve. We are to love God with all the determination that we have. Not with someone else's, but with our own. Love him with all our strength. And of course, these, in thinking about strength, one can't but reflect on the words in Isaiah. Isaiah 40, which we think about and may not read them, but they're, they're there in our, our Christian experience. Isaiah 40, verse 28 says this, Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the ev everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. And his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Some wonderful promises through these words, isn't it? He gives strength to the weary. He increases the power of the weak. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. So we might sometimes feel we use up our strength, but the promise of these words is that God renews our strength. God supplies us with more strength, that we can go on using all our strength and all our determination and resolution to love God as much as we can with all that we have our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. Loving him. Not as a time filler, not as an extra, not as a hobby, but as number one, because this is the greatest commandment. This is the most important thing of all. And why is this so? It is, of course, because he has loved me and he has loved you. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Is that a sufficient motivation for you this morning to love him? I hope so. I pray so. That the reality of the, ref of the meaning of those words that God himself came in the form of his son and he died for you and for me because he loves us and therefore it's the most natural thing of all, isn't it? To love him in return. To love him in return because he gave his life for us he gave his life for us. And what can we give him? We Really, in the end, the only everlasting thing we have is our love. 
will love him in return because he has loved us. Let's pray. Oh God, our Father, we just thank you this morning for how much you've loved us. How great is your love for us. We are here this morning, Lord, wanting to love you in return. But Lord, it is, it is because, Lord, it is because you have loved us. And Lord, you know about all about each one of us. You know the choices we make. You know the times we fail you. The times we pursue other things. We seek other things. We think that we can prioritize you and others. But Lord, we know that you are jealous and you will only accept being number one. And so this morning, Lord, we want to we want to, Lord, leave behind our duplicity and to pursue you and follow you wholeheartedly and love you with all that we are. Because, Lord, that is how you have loved us and died for us. Lord, we have the proof. We have the evidence. Help us, Lord, to love you. In return, we pray. For your name's sake, we ask it. Amen. We're going to come and share communion together.